Hello, everyone. So I'd like to just review what we've been talking about with the short time Fourier transform because it's very important. And also just to provide some notes so you have a reference. And there's a few things I want to talk about um, that we didn't quite finish in class. So just to remind you how this all starts off, um, if I want to do the discrete Fourier transform on some audio where things are actually changing over time. So that was me playing the chromatic scale. Um, so it's not just a single note the whole time. And what that means is if you try to do the discrete Fourier transform and you look at the amplitudes, everything gets kind of mixed together. You can't really localize the frequencies. Um, so what we do instead is we end up splitting this up into a bunch of little chunks of audio. Um, each audio has as many samples in it as the so-called window length. Okay, so each little window of audio, we do the discrete Fourier transform just on that. And then we move from one window to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, and we move in increments of hop length. And so we're going to do the discrete Fourier transform in every single little window. And we're going to put them all together into an image. So I created a method here that does that. Um, if you just report the amplitudes of the discrete Fourier transform and you don't um, report the phases or, or the individual sine or cosine components, then it's called a spectrogram. That's a special name for the short time Fourier transform um, when you have amplitude only. So I went over in class how this works. Um, and I'm going to create actually a table or an image, so a two-dimensional array, where along the rows I'm going to have um, frequency indices, and along the columns I'm going to have time indices, um, window indices of the window, so, so which window am I looking at. So if I look at that chromatic scale again, um, what I see is, hang on, where's my chromatic scale? There it is. Um, okay, let me actually, let me choose my window length around, let's say, 2048, hop length 56. So, and let me zoom in a little bit on the frequencies here. So, pl2.lylm, I'll go for, look from zero to 3000, is probably enough. Um, okay, and let me actually, I was only looking two seconds here, let me look at the whole thing. And I also want to, oops, I need to say 3,000, zero. Okay. Okay, so, this, so the lowest frequencies down here, the highest ones are up here. And so you see this kind of staircase pattern, but that goes up in an exponent, because remember, the frequency is actually exponential in pitch. So I was changing my pitch linearly, but that meant the frequency changed exponentially over time. So you can see the staircase pattern happens because I'm holding a note, so that's each stair. Um, and then I, then I move up in frequency over time. You, you can also see all the harmonics, which, which also move up. So that's kind of neat. Um, if I make my window length a little shorter, um, I still get the same pattern, but I don't have the same resolution, right? I only have as many frequencies as there are um, samples in my chunk of audio, over two, really. So, if my window length is smaller, that means I don't have as many frequency indices. I have to spread out my frequencies over the same range, but with fewer numbers. So you can see it, it becomes a little harder to resolve. If I make my window length even shorter, now it's really hard to, to pick things out. I jump from, actually, if I print out what my frequencies are, um, so I, I jump from, I have a bin um, I have a frequency at zero, and I jump straight to a frequency of 172, straight to a frequency of 344. You're not going to be able to tell the difference between individual notes this way. But if I increase my window length to back up to 1024, now I have enough resolution to tell the difference between notes. I, I still have a jump, but um, I jump in a smaller increment here because I just have more frequency bends. So you see the difference in the image. Okay, so we have this trade-off where we want to have a higher frequency resolution, but the problem is in order to get a higher frequency resolution, our windows need to be longer, which means that they start to bleed in time. 
So if I make this window too long, um, then some of the notes start to blur together. You can see a little bit. Um, if I make it equal to the sample rate, for example, so an entire second of audio for each window, then you really see that the notes are starting to blur again. Um, so there's this time frequency trade-off in terms of uh, time frequency resolution. If I want to be able to resolve things in time, that means I, I really need to narrow in my window length, but, but I don't get the same frequency resolution. So that's one of the key trade-offs here. So 10 to 24 was like a pretty good amount and that's pretty commonly used. Um, actually, let me make sure the sample rate is exactly, yeah, so I guess with, with a sample rate, of 44,100, 1024 or 2048 are pretty commonly accepted. Hop length is actually a little longer than that, probably around 256. These are pretty common values. And you can see they work well here. Um, so anyway, that, that's pretty commonly used. Okay, I do wanna show you another example though. Um, that's kind of interesting. So I started this in class, I tried to do it live and then I, I actually discovered a little bug in my code and now I understand what's going on better. I also realized that we have to look at the full range of frequencies, so I was messing that up. But let, let me show you what the audio signal is. So um, I was doing vibrato in my violin. So let me show you one of them and let's, let's just play the audio. Okay, so let me load this in. We'll look, we'll, we'll look at that in a second, but let's, let's just listen to the audio. Okay, so that's me doing vibrato. I'm at a B5. Okay, so so um, one, two half steps above um, the octave above concert A. Uh, so what I notice over time is this wiggling. Uh, but I also notice all the harmonics. Okay, so B5, what is that? That should be, four, as I said, 440 times 2 raised to the 14 over 12. Okay, so, so the bass frequency should be around a thousand, and, that, and that's what I see, right? I see, I see this line down here. Now I'm doing vibrato, which means that, that I'm going back and forth in frequency. I don't have the resolution to see that, actually, in this plot. Um, you know, when I print out the frequencies that I'm using, you know, when I was doing vibrato before, I was going back and forth by about 10 hertz, if you remember, when I was synthesizing vibrato. Um, if I print out these frequencies here, let's just hone in on, um, let's just hone in on like around the base frequency there. Let's see if that, okay. So here's some frequency bins around where I'm doing vibrato. So, so I told you that the note should be at around 987 hertz and I'm going back and forth. Well, you see going within 10 hertz of 987, you, you're gonna bounce back and forth maybe a little bit into this bin, maybe a little bit into this bin. I don't have the resolution here to see that. Okay, I mean, again, I could try to go up in resolution. I could try to say, well, let me make my window length much longer. But then, so let's see. And now I, I'm able to go down to pretty, pretty fine. Uh, but I lose the back and forth because that's happening at a fine time resolution. So for vibrato, what we need to do to detect it actually is to look at the harmonics. So if I go back down to a reasonable window length, um, yeah, I'm not able to see the, the, the back and forth in the bass frequency, but I'm able to see it in the harmonics because remember the harmonics are actually uh, multiples of the bass frequency. So let me say, okay, how many harmonics do I have here? Let's, let's let me go up to like 10 harmonics. So, so 10 times this, is that and suddenly a deviation of 10 hertz turns into a deviation of 100 hertz and I can actually see it. Um, so that's that's one thing you get that's interesting from the fact that harmonics are multiplicative. So I just wanted to point that out. So, so this was th that was the B6. Um, let me also show you the B7. So I went up an octave. Or no, sorry, that was a B5. Let me show you the B6. Okay, so I'm gonna go up an octave and we'll look. Um, and you see, yeah, they're further apart and there aren't as many of them as a result. Partially just to prove to you that I could do that. 
But anyway, okay, so, so, so we're starting to see some pretty interesting stuff in the spectrograms, right? We can see the change in notes. We can also see these, these features like vibrato. We can see all the harmonics, right? That's, that's a pretty interesting thing. We're, we're now able to, to verify that this happens in real instruments. Um, and, you know, this is a very powerful tool. This is going to form the basis, so to speak, of most of the tests that we're going to do when we get to uh, music signal analysis. Okay, so that was just a recap. Uh, but now I want to talk about something else. So click the next button when you're ready.